You're listening to Advancing Our Church. Welcome to Advancing Our Church, a Changing Our World podcast about Catholic stewardship, leadership, and advancement. I'm Jim Friend. A couple of weeks ago, we are proud to interview a true legend in the business world, Mr. Larry Bossidy. I had the honor of working with Larry in the Diocese of Allentown on strategic planning under Bishop John Barris and Bishop Alfred Schlert. It was a real educational experience for me because it gave me the rare chance to learn business planning from one of the best business minds in the world. When Larry first came on board, Bishop Barris asked each of the diocesan secretaries to get a copy of Larry's book, which was called Execution, The Discipline of Getting Things Done. And this was a way for us to learn the principles of how Larry operates. So I like to joke that when your boss hands out a book with the title Execution at the top, some in the room might have gotten just a little bit nervous. But what we quickly realized was that the purpose of the book was to call out why businesses fail and what were the essential components of a business plan that had to be in place in order for it to succeed. And so while Larry's experience was focused on the business world, there was so much that we could do to adopt these insights to the work of advancing our church. So Bishop Barris quotes Thomas Edison in saying that vision without execution is hallucination. And while that's funny, it's also incredibly true. Larry cites three core processes that must be in place in order for a business to succeed. Number one, the people process. We know that the work we do in the church is essentially a people-oriented business. Getting the right people in the right position is critical to our success. Number two, strategy. Having the right, well-thought-out, and disciplined strategy or approach can make or break our work. And lastly, number three, operations. You can have great people and a great strategy, but if your office isn't open to it and adaptable for a changing culture, you're sunk. There was so much wisdom in Larry's book that I'm rereading it this summer, and I'm digesting it with maybe a little more experience than I did the first time around. I want to encourage you to pick up a copy. I'll leave a link in the show notes for you to follow. And maybe over the next few weeks, I'll pull out a passage or two and reflect on it with you. Now, let's get to work. As we continue our July theme of summer planning, today I'm joined by three of Changing Our World's expert consultants, Colleen Burdick, Ray Witzkowski, and Caitlin McTighig. And we're going to be talking about putting together a solid case for support for your organization. We recorded this last month during our annual staff retreat in New York. And we are actually in a lobby, so you'll hear the occasional background noise. Apologies in advance if you hear some chatter. And so, without further ado, here's our conversation. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. So glad to have you with us today. I'm here with Caitlin McTighg, Colleen Burdick, and Ray Witkowski. And uh, we're talking about developing your case for support. And uh, what we'll do first is we'll go around the table here and uh, we will introduce ourselves. So, Ray, why don't you go first? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Ray Witkowski. I serve as Managing Director at Changing Our World. And I work uh, predominantly in the education um, side of our work uh, within the firm, uh, within secondary and higher education. Excellent. Colleen? Hi, I'm Colleen Burdick. I'm a Senior Managing Director here at Changing Our World. I've been with the firm for a little over a decade now. Uh, a lot of my work has primarily been with education and Catholic-focused clients, um, mostly really in, in studies and campaigns. Um, done the, the full spectrum of our services, but those a lot of my work has been in those areas. Excellent. Okay, Caitlin. Great. Caitlin McTighe. I'm a managing director here at Changing Our World. I've been with the firm since January, and before that was a frontline fundraiser for a number of different nonprofits. Um, And I work mostly with the faith-based accounts right now, um, and also one human services account. Fantastic. So um, maybe we should start with the question, and and Ray, you're going to lead us through some of these, uh, some of this discussion, but um, what is a case for support, and, you know, why is it important? Anybody want to take that one? Well, sure. I can start off a little bit. Um, you know, traditionally, a, a case for support, many uh, folks uh, would refer to it as a case statement. Um, you, in, during a campaign, there's a major brochure that's developed that is the creative statement, the creative representation of the campaign, sort of the theme, 
uh, why the campaign is, is, is being launched and the initiatives that the uh, campaign is going to support. But what should precede that, and this is a lot of the work that we do at Change Our World, is in helping our clients through a campaign planning or feasibility study, we have to test whether a campaign is literally feasible. Uh, what the goal is, uh, what the objectives are, and so on and so forth. And we need to be able to test those objectives. So the case for support end up ends up being more of a case summary, uh, which really is a succinct document that will uh, summarize the organization, the institution, uh, you know, where it is, its founding, uh, the challenges that it has in, in the present day, and how the campaign in of itself is going to help the institution or organization uh, move forward. So really it becomes your, you know, that, that element, that compelling reason for prospective donors to want to support your organization or your institution. What's the connection that they have, um, you know, in terms of, you know, is it, is your organization and what you do um, in the mindset of your prospective donors, um, you know, in terms of their philanthropic uh, priorities. So it, there's a number of elements uh, that, you know, we try to work with our clients to really make sure that, you know, they, they don't try to say too much. You know, it's got to be a brief document. That's why we call it a summary to allow donors to have something that they can easily uh, digest and relate to. Um, so those are, those are some of the initial elements that we, you know, as we're thinking of, you know, why the case for uh, case for support should be developed. Yeah, I would just add in, um, you know, three things to definitely keep in mind as you're developing this case statement. You know, it's certainly from the perspective of the donor and it has to reflect the ethos of the organization in a really big way. Um, but as a donor, as you're reading this, it should become very clear you know, why this particular organization, why now, and why me? So what's the three compelling reasons that tie that all together and make me want to actually support and give even more generously than I would have to this organization before? And I think just kind of building off that, <clears throat> you know, what's the impact? Like, by giving to this case, by giving to this organization, how does my gift make an impact? So really, really using the case for support to, or the case statement to to pull at the heartstrings to say, like, this is the why, this is the nuts and bolts, this is where we're going, you know, for the future. Um, and this is how we're going to, we're going to address our needs right now. You make a great point, Colleen. A, a case for a good case for support has not only the facts and the details and the figures, but mm -hmm. an emotional appeal, appeal to our donors, mm -hmm. so that it reaches them where they live, helps them to respond to that mission. Absolutely, and the, the one aspect that I found uh, that through this process of working with our clients, um, we're we're helping our clients to see beyond the you know a case simply for fundraising purposes that it has an, a, an opportunity for them to um, kind of describe themselves in a more compelling way. It's not that we're trying to redefine an organization or, um, you, know, uh, you know, change the way they operate and so on and so forth, but really helping them describe who they are to really get at that, um, you know, their, their brand promise. And, and this is all you know, relative to, you know, our Catholic diocesan accounts, our um, uh, educational clients, and so on, that when they begin seeing those elements, there's an opportunity for the case to almost sustain itself beyond the campaign, that it's an opportunity for them to be able to see, uh, you know, those key aspects, those key reasons for uh, donors to want to continue to engage uh Stakeholders continue to engage beyond the campaign being completed, and that, and that's the beauty of when a real strong, compelling case uh, comes about. It has a, a quite a longevity to it. So, if a development director is li listening to this, and maybe they've inherited a case for support, and they're looking at their annual fund, and you know, what do you think? What are the, some of the first things they should do when they're evaluating their current case for support? Any thoughts? 
I think first of all, I mean, it's always a living, breathing document. So, you know, you create it at a certain point in time and what's reflective of the organization right then and there. But, you know, as you move towards those goals, you're going to have to refine it. You're going to have to develop it. And even as you're moving towards a campaign, you may need to flesh out certain areas of it, have more detail, um, embed more stories so you can touch the heartstrings. So, I mean, they should always look at it with uh, fresh perspective, fresh eyes, and know that it's certainly a living, breathing document as long as it keeps the core values of the organization intact. And if a development director has inherited uh, for you know someone coming new into an organization, maybe there's a, an existing case for support, as you mentioned, Jim, one of the aspects of uh, being able to um, see whether the, the case is still relevant, um, still a, a reflection of the organization, is to engage uh, per, you know, prospective constituents and your current constituents and, and ask for their advice, ask for their input. Is this still a reflection of who we are? Um, is this the organization? Maybe it's who we were four or five years ago, but we've since changed and we have a new, you know, maybe not necessarily a new mission, but maybe a new vision uh, for the organization. So the, those development directors have an opportunity of engaging um, prospective audiences. And it's not about engaging them to do an, a, an, uh, an ask per se. It's really for advice and input and refining that um, case. So that is really reflective of not only the organization, but it's reflective of the audience or the audiences that are going to be seeing it and reading it and embracing it, hopefully. The other piece I would add to that is, you know, beyond just continuing to refine and looking at it as a moving, you know, or, or living, breathing document, you know, thinking about, okay, well, what has already been done? You know, with have we accomplished any of these needs within? And, and really looking back and, and where can we report on the impact that's already been made? You know, as we're doing any fundraising effort, the sooner that we can say, hey, here's what we're trying to do, here's the progress we've been made, and look at, we already were able to achieve some of these items outlined in our case. You know, so thinking about that as, as the case continues to grow and be refined, where can we highlight some of those early successes to show that, you know, show the strength of it um, and the actual need, and, and not only the need, but that through gifts and, and the efforts of, of their donors, we're being able to move the needle um, and that they are securing support for uh, what was outlined in the case. So let's switch gears maybe if, you, uh, you know, we've all developed cases for support for a capital campaign. Maybe we should talk a little bit about what goes into developing your case for support for a capital campaign. Certainly, the first step is creating a feasibility study in that process, but now, when, you, when you're developing that case for support going into the feasibility, what are you looking for? One key aspect when we're talking with, uh, I have a client right now, and we're beginning to have conversations with them in terms of a pending campaign. And some, there are clients that we work with that have already established a goal, have established uh, certain priorities and uh, uh, objectives, uh, we refer to it uh, informally as the campaign buckets, you know, in terms of a campaign goal and you start breaking it down in terms of uh, maybe three or four um, uh, elements. That really becomes the, the initial part of it. What are we doing this for? What's going to be the, uh, to Colleen's uh, point, the impact of this campaign? Uh, because prospective donors may want to contribute something to a campaign that might be more bricks and mortar. They want to contribute to buildings and so on and so forth. There are donors who may want to contribute to something that's a bit more, uh, I don't want to say intangible, but maybe scholarships, if you will, or uh, maybe, you know, from a, uh, uh, you know, helping to uh, our parish campaigns for promoting evangelization and pro putting in programs. So it's really helping the client to define what the priorities are for because that's going to be the core element of the case. It's almost like that's the real core content um, in terms of you know, making sure that um, you know, prospective donors understand why the organization is going through the campaign itself. So it's not, you know, we first have to see if the campaign is feasible but, of course, we have to understand uh, and make sure what is it that donors may, may contribute to. 
and really outlining those those priorities. I think whenever we can also really make sure that it's the case for support is built on the the mission, the vision of the organization, and and a strategic plan. Now that being said, it's not always lined up in, in perfect <laughs> steps that way. That's for sure, and that's okay. Um, but it's a good opportunity to go back and to look at that and say. We want to make sure that what we're going to raise these funds for supports what, you know, where you're trying to go. What is your vision for the next 5, 10, 15 years? What's the impact it's going to make? Um, you know, really looking back and making sure that, you know, yes, we come in, we're helping a lot of these organizations, but we have to make it sound, it needs to sound like them. We don't want it to sound like like changing our world. Right. We, we want it to sound like them because it's it's their language. It's it's what they're trying, you know, their goals. They're trying to, to reach their donors. And we want to make sure that it feels that way. So it's really important, you know, even from like the culture side with every client, every organization we're working with that we we understand the language that they use, you know, the key words, um, the terminology, you know, even when it comes down to the, the font and the pictures right. and the color, you know, like when <laughs> sure. you get into those details, yeah. but it's important because it needs to sound like them and it needs to be just a continuation of, of, you know, how they're developing, you know, and, and them moving forward. So it's just it, so that it feels natural yeah. um, because then it will resonate more with the donors. It will feel familiar and they'll be more inclined, hopefully, <laughs> um, to give and support the the needs of the organization for that campaign. Colleen makes a very good point. I mean, that's, that's really making sure that, you know, we factor in the authenticity of what we're helping the client, um, uh, you know, communicate because uh, again, that it, it almost becomes a uh, a discussion guide, if you will, a meeting with a donor um, and making sure that uh, it, through those conversations, you know, the major gift officers and those frontline development fundraisers, you know, ha again, have that succinct document that they can speak to from their own voice. And Caitlin and I were working on a, a client project and. There was the subtle nuances of certain words that they wanted changed, uh, and we we were so glad to have that type of feedback because the client was beginning to take ownership of it. And again, we were providing the editorial input and the editorial platform, uh, but at the same time, they were nuancing it and said, "Well, this is the way we kind of talk about ourselves," and, and, and it's that's so great. It, so it, absolutely, yeah. mm -hmm. because that's where the, the that authenticity, and they were you know they take ownership of it, but at the same time, they it was inspiring for them. They were embracing it. Yeah, we can do this. It, it becomes almost a an inspirational uh, aspect, and as it should. I mean, that that's the one aspect of a case. It's got to be inspiring. Yeah. Um, you know, going forward. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I would say beyond even just the developing, the crafting of the case, you know, I'm finding probably in the past five years or so, especially, but philanthropy is changing. There's more competition out there, you know, so, so donors are, are more demanding than they used to be and, and good for them. They should be, um, <laughs> about, well, what is, you know, what is my dollar going to do? What is the impact, but also the metrics and the measurable, you know, what are those benchmarks to say, okay, if you're going to build this building, well, how many new students is it going to serve? Or how many, you know, people uh, can, can gather in this new gathering space at a, at a parish, you know, a new parish center, whatever it may be, but that people want to know what, how are we going to know if we got there? What's the time frame in which it will be built? You know, so even taking it a step further, but, um, you know, I find that we have to, we have to kind of rein in a lot of those details that maybe we didn't need to have in the beginning, um, years, a few years ago, but, um, it's important. And I think again, that helps communicate to prospects and, and donors. Here's, here's the plan. And it really has been really thought out and, and here's how it can help us. And, and this is why. And that's what people, more and more, they, they need to know, they demand to know before making that gift because they're being asked for gifts from so many different wonderful organizations. So oh, yeah. we need to make sure that, uh, you know, that they understand why that our right. whatever organization it is, that that's the number one that we need them for. Yeah. And just sort of building on that too, I think you bring up two points there, which is striking that balance of being aspirational in the language, but also being realistic in terms of, you know, the, the goals that are achievable. And then the second piece, the unique value proposition that that client brings. And really, um, in terms of first steps, knowing the space, knowing what peers are doing, what makes peers unique, and what differentiates this client from other peers. So that, again, it can be authentic, it can be their voice, and it can be really compelling for their donors. 
And Caitlin, you made a point earlier in those three key questions that I always have in my mind. You know, why? I got that from you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it sounded familiar. <laughs> See? That's um, a great compliment. You know, <laughs> why this organization? You know, why now? And why me? And I, it, it, one aspect of the, developing the case is, is asking the question, what would happen if we don't do this? So there's that sense of, you know, that sense of urgency, if yes. you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's part, that, that's a key, you know, it's, you, you're not necessarily looking to, uh, uh, you know, communicate it literally. Um, but at the same point, just having that in mind that, you know, this organization exists uh, for, for a reason. And we need these types of organizations. We need the church to exist. And, um, you know, if, if it wasn't for this organization to Colleen's point, I wouldn't be able to do this. Or if it wasn't for this organization, I wouldn't be able to, um, you know, fulfill my own personal mission or aspects of my faith, if you will, or whatever that, whatever, or from an educational standpoint too, is, you know, if it wasn't for this educational institution, I wouldn't be where it uh, where I am today, so this 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 school or this organization must must exist, and and if it doesn't, you know this could ha you know this is the ramifications. So there's that that aspect of you know just keeping in mind if we don't do this, yeah, there's 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 you know lasting effects. And I think that we've all seen different examples of cases for support where yes, it would be great to do that, but. Why should we, right? And that's right. what the donor is going to ask. And that's the question right. we have to ask ourselves before we put it out in front of right. folks. Right. Has, has any, uh, Ray, I think you mentioned one earlier, but has anyone um, come in con had a situation where they were, were discussing their case for support with a donor or even in a study and you had to course correct, you know, say, so, oh, wait, this isn't quite ringing true with the organization. This isn't quite hitting the mark. Anybody? Various examples, and I you talked about it earlier about the, the you know the campaign buckets and the priorities, and the client may come into the case development process with you know three key areas, and they'll start prioritizing, um, you know, from an internal standpoint, what they see as the key goals of the campaign. But when you're talking with a donor, the donor is going to prioritize those elements based on his or her uh, philanthropic uh, priorities. And we've had a number of, you know, conversations, especially through the feasibility study is, you know, testing what elements a prospective donor is going to want to support. And as they read the initial case for support, they'll react to it and they'll stay and they'll say very honestly, um, I'm not really sure I'm, you know, number one and number three, yeah, they're not really in my philanthropic uh, mindset right now, but number two, Ray, that's, yeah, that's what I would support. Um, there's other aspects where, um, you know, it's working with clients who may have too many priorities. That's the other, you know, and that's a challenging because they, they're, they're still struggling internally of what the campaign is going to support. And that's another element where we're, you know, we, we may have to course correct. Uh, just because the, the campaign is getting a bit unwielding because there's no one can really decide ultimately, uh, you know, what the future of the campaign is going to be. And, you know, that might be a, an element where we just have to kind of take a step back, um, you know, whether it, it's a course correction or is it, you know, we see a campaign, but maybe now is not the right time because there's just too many elements um, that, you know, or challenges that might be uh, in front of us, in front of the organization. You know, I find with the, the study, I know sometimes, you know, organizations are reluctant to want to, why embark on it? Why is this a necessary process? I think it's very rare where we don't find things out during that study process that really do help shape the case, whether it be how needs are prioritized or something that was missing or, you know, um, or really any of those or, or how, when are we going to address them? What, what are those needs? Like, I think that that's part of it. I think that the study itself, it really becomes, you know, to, to, on, to what Ray was saying, but like one, level deeper, you know, what resonates with each of these donors, you know, really having that conversation with them to understand them. It's such a, it's a cultivation piece. And that study really becomes the roadmap to laying out a successful plan for the campaign. So even if it's maybe not finding some huge 
earth shattering, you know, amazing piece of, you know, that a change that should be made to the case. There's so much information that can make your campaign successful that's found during that study process that um, I, I just find it, it's just so beneficial for making sure that the right plan is in place to achieve success. And we become essentially ambassadors for our clients and the organizations with whom we're, we're working uh, with on this process. And during the conversations with donors, and you know, it's been my experience, is they are very, very honest because we're, we're sort of the outside objective um, uh, you know, player or uh, part of the process. And that helps um, us to go back to the client and not necessarily tell them what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. And it's not necessarily changing our world. It's their donors, their, their constituents that are communicating back. Um, you know, this is not connecting with me for one reason or another. Um, and that is to Colleen's point, that process just starts to, you know, bring a number of things to the surface. Some very good, some may be challenges, but the client wasn't aware of it because, uh, and the, through this process, uh, we were able to uh, bring certain things to the surface. And I think too, we have a unique responsibility in that whole process because, you know, they're, there, and this is a much larger debate, but donors driving programmatic initiatives um, and whether they should be the main drivers of those programmatic initiatives or whether, um, you know, the staff and the executive director um, who are on the ground and know what's going on. So like sort of being the mediator between those two parties and flagging what needs to be flagged as far as feedback for this really important group, which is donors, um, which, which are going to drive fundraising but also being able to provide the executive team and the staff with the confidence they need to also say, no, this is what we really need. And, um, you know, I'm going to push back maybe and say, here's another reason why you should consider supporting this. Um, so it, again, it's like that fine balance of um, trying to, to make sure that what's really needs to be done gets done, um, but that this group of stakeholders is working collaboratively with the staff to make sure it's the right message. Right, right. And it also uncovers, I talked about it earlier, just in, not challenges from a negative standpoint, but it the conversations go beyond fundraising, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we have a client that, you know, through the feasibility initial interview process, uh, as, again, talking about a campaign, but they were bringing in conversations just in terms of the brand awareness of the organization that folks didn't really know what this organization did. They knew of it on a very local regional level, but not on a national level. So that sense of awareness of, you know, going through a national campaign, they said, I don't think this is going to be able to, um, you know, start off and be successful because I think there's just a lot of brand awareness that the organization needs to put forward first before actually getting into more of a, uh, you know, campaign conversation. And I think we see that a lot with the faith-based clients um, only because there's this charism of humility, which is so beautiful and it's been such a tradition, but they don't normally speak about themselves in a marketing and branding type way. True. So this can open up a, a whole new world to a lot of the folks that we work with and an important one because as we know, the face of philanthropy is changing and you need to be able to you know, share your impact in a really compelling way to get donors to support. It's been interesting working um, with one of our diocesan clients. A big component of their case is evangelization. And, you know, going in and telling the parishes, well, you know, some of the needs that this campaign is going to support should be evan evangelization. Well, what's that? What What do we do? What's the right program? What's the right thing? And um, in this particular diocese, you know, it really, we're going to the parishes and saying, well, it's different for, and I, I think probably across the board, it's different for everyone. Everyone is unique. Um, so we've really been leaning on volunteers and, and, you know, parish leadership to say, what, you know, how do you get more people in the pews on the weekend? You know, how do you build a, 
a parish community? How do you grow that culture? What it, it may be, you put some funds aside to have a, a picnic during the summer. All you know that's that's covered, that's paid for, that everybody comes together. Or it may be for a new faith formation leader, or you know. But it's different for everyone. So you know, really getting the client and, you know, on a diocesan level going into the parishes and it, it really each parish becomes a different client. Um, but getting them to, to own and understand, um, and, and really use the case to communicate where they're going, where are they going? Where do they want to go and And how are they going to get there? Um, it's not always an easy task. I've found that it's taken longer to put some of our campaign cases together at the parish level, um, because they quite honestly haven't always been asked that, you know, well, Oh, you, we have to come up with the, there isn't just a set program that works perfect for everyone. Um, but it's been a really, I think, valuable learning experience, um, both as, you know, from the consultant side, um, but on the parish level. And it's really given them, I've been so just, just surprised, pleasantly surprised and, and just excited, um, by the leaders who have really taken the ownership and are excited to get involved. Um, this, the volunteer, uh, just like the excitement that's coming from so many of them is something I, you don't necessarily always see. Um, so it's, it's, it's challenging, yes, yes, at times, but it's but it's exciting and it really is I feel like it, it goes back to what we as Change Our World try to do is to leave them in a better position than they currently are. And I think going in and even though we may be pushing them to, you know, harder to, to put some more clarity or or put a price tag or put, you know, a prioritization of, of the needs, um, it's helping them to think in ways that maybe they didn't. And and the hope is that once they, they raise the money and they complete the goals and, and that will continue to grow so that we're we're leaving them truly in a better place um, than they were when we started. Colleen, you made a very good point just from the diocesan aspect as we're working on a diocesan based campaign. So you have a case for support for the diocese overall, but to Colleen's point, based on the number of parishes within that diocese, you're going to be creating, you know, almost like hundred different case for, for cases for support for each specific parish. Sure. Yeah. And the parishes oftentimes have a hesitancy of wanting to be part of a larger campaign when they're being very successful at, at their own right. You know, and so like, what do we need the diocesan based campaign for? Because we can do, do it ourselves or we'll, we'll be fine on our own and just helping them understand that they're part of the greater good and every, you know, the, and all, everybody all working together, uh, will make it a, you know, a stronger, um, you know, a, a stronger Catholic community within that diocese. And then it's a learning process, uh, because like th these parishes have done, um, in their minds, very successful on their own. Um, so it's, it's, it's also helping to build a relationship between the, each of the parishes with the diocese, um, itself and the, the relationship that they have with the bishop or archbishop. Uh, that's another element that we, you know, we work very diligently on in terms of the relationship and, uh, between the, these entities and the, that, that case development process, you know, it uncovers these types of elements. And I think we're seeing campaigns themselves shifting away from not just the capital campaign. You know, so many people, you hear campaign and they immediately think capital campaign where there's a building project involved. Um, and, and much of the work and, and the clients that we're working with, I think that's not all of it. There may be some capital components, uh, especially when you're talking about evangelization. You know, maybe they want to make the, the space more warm and welcoming or, or larger to fit more folks. Um, and that may be a capital project. There may be a capital project tied to that. Um, but having them think beyond, you know, not just the capital piece of it, but but what else? What's the programmatic piece that we can include? Um, and how can we come up with a nice balance uh, with, you know, with both of those items, capital and programmatic, when we're building these cases so that we can truly include something for everyone so that more people do feel inclined to support the initiative. Any do's or don'ts when putting together your case for support? Anything that you've come across and said, woof, wish I hadn't done that? Or uh, something, if somebody were putting together their own case for support right now, you know, what do they want to be aware of, be careful of? Well, I think a development director, um, he or she should not feel that they should be solely responsible for developing the case. I mm -hmm. think the more input that they can glean from 
you know, other members of the, of the staff, other uh, parishioners, um, you know, prospective donors, um, you know, just ask questions. Don't don't try to develop the case solely in a you know as we say in a vacuum because it's just gonna it's 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 gonna be the organization or the diocese diocese speak and it's not gonna you know have that voice um, of the donor uh, and, that, and that's key and I think that's one of the uh, big benefits of the process that we entail is we, you know we bring in we you know it's bring in that consensus building process. Um, so, you know, that's one of the advices that I have is that, you know, not one person should be responsible for the, for its development. You know, supporting that, I also really like when we do, um, uh, like an internal case or, or the, the case is in draft, so to speak, um, mode for a little bit longer, you know, so maybe you're bringing, you're going through your leadership solicitation visits, um, and kind of still waiting to maybe say, okay, final, final, until you get through those, till you get that final kind of buy-in from that that internal circle of, of key donors and, and giving them an opportunity if they weren't part of the study process or even if they were, giving them another opportunity to kind of buy in and and be a part of refining it. So I think it's really... I think it's really beneficial to say, you know, here's our campaign case, but we're going to give ourselves, we're, we're maybe not going to print, you know, 50,000 just yet. We're going to give ourselves a moment to, to get through the first 20 or 30 or, or a hundred visits, depending on obviously the size of the organization. Um, we're going to give ourselves a little bit of time so that we can make sure if there's any little tweaks in terms of language or more clarity is needed or, you know, even sometimes when you're trying to put an estimate on, uh, or, you know, a price tag, so to speak, on each of the needs, you know, they, though, they may need to change or the prioritization may need to change and just kind of giving yourself a little extra wiggle room before, um, before kind of saying this is, this is it, it's a done deal, here it is, we're, we're putting it everywhere. Just a little more room and space to, to do some of those refinements and those editing. I think, I think it's really valuable and I think it's often so many times you end up having to make some tweaks anyway after you go into those right. really right. early visits. Yeah. Um, so I think just building that into your timeline is really, really helpful. That to just build on that, the patience and the flexibility is yes. key <laughs> because if you want to draft something and create something that's going to really move people, it's going to take a while. Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to have to be a lot of input and there's going to be a lot of drafts and a lot of changes. Um, there also has to be that compelling visionary piece to it. And so you have to work collaboratively with the executive director, with the chairman of the board or the chairwoman of the board to really make sure that that part of it is, is singing throughout the document. And that takes time. Um, so patience, patience, patience <laughs> is definitely the name of the game. And to your point earlier, Jim, about, you know, a course correction. And again, it's, uh, as Colleen and Caitlin have talked about, having that flexibility and letting the, letting the campaign and that case be that living, breathing, you know, element, things will change. And it might be a year into the campaign and there might be an appropriate course correction that's needed. Maybe the goal is not going to be what it, we thought it was going to be early on. Uh, so there's major adjustments, but the case again has that, um, uh, if done right, has, uh, you're, you're not going to lose the authenticity of it. You're not going to lose the compelling argument, but at the same time, there might be some different priorities that, uh, need to be adjusted, um, accordingly. Uh, clients often in the initial, this is sort of a, you know, the do's and don'ts, uh, aspect too, is, they may want to, um, you know, the, the case might be too long. You know, they may want to have just a lot of narrative. And, that, and as we said earlier, the case for support, the summary, you know, we're two to three pages. That's really what we're looking for. Uh, because again, uh, the donor is not going to want to read a long, you know, document uh, initially. And that's another aspect that we, um, you know, working with clients, oftentimes they have a draft case for support that they've developed and they're asking us to refine it. I've had a number of instances where we become, you know, editors um, and also guiding the client is, you know, you can, you can be more concise. Uh, there's three words I always talk about, be, you know, be concise, be compelling and be consistent. 
uh, because if you start mixing in different words and different ways of describing yourself, um, there's going to be a disconnect. Um, so you know, the, the, a lot of the content is there for, for, for clients. It's just helping them to, to see it. Um, you know, I would also say when it comes to what is the right vehicle, you know, just do what's right for your organization. You know, sometimes it is, here's a three page word document. Sometimes people prefer it to be in like a PowerPoint deck and it's, you know, a lot more visuals and, and, and few words. Um, sometimes it's a little trifold, you know, know that there's a lot of different ways to communicate it. Um, and in some cases, maybe you choose more than one, but know that do what's right and feels comfortable for you and your organization. Because if it feels so far off and it feels not like you, because maybe it's new or in some cases, just know that you, you can shift and, and make it feel like you and pick what, what fits best. Um, for your organization, you know, we typically, depending on where we're at in the campaign, you know, maybe we'll do, you know, a summary or, or uh, a deck for, for maybe some of the, the larger initial quiet phase asks uh, of leadership. But then when we get to the public phase, you know, maybe that's too much information and we're switching to a, more of a trifold or a one pager. Um, so just know and keep in mind, you know, what, not only what are we sharing, what are the, what's the context or what's the communication piece? But what is that vehicle that we're putting that into, um, and how how do we make sure that we're picking the right one uh, to to share that with the donors, um, so that it does feel familiar, um, but it also resonates with them. You may have a few different versions based on the audience. You know, for the business community. Maybe you have more charts, more numbers, more bullet points um, for, you know, someone who's more in the arts world. Maybe you have more visuals. So being able to share the message through different mediums for different audiences is definitely a best practice. Excellent. And also embracing the fact that you're going to have a generational aspect with sure. your prospective donors and how they communicate and um find information social media has opened up an, an, uh, a tremendous avenue for clients to be able to use that as a vehicle to you know to, for engaging and communicating with the younger uh, audiences we're uh, doing a lot of discussions here at change our world you know just in terms of how organizations need to embrace that younger generation the millennials and the, the gen z's uh, as they're commonly referred to and finding ways of how do we how do we get our case in front of these audiences? So, you know, the Colleen's point, there are those organizations that will follow a more traditional route because that is what works for their donors. It's not sure. necessarily, you know, what works for the organization, but it's how the donors have connected with the organization over time. And then also being open and embracing new ways of getting your case in front of uh, different audiences. So, uh, you know, the, the, the Catholic climate that we're in, certainly there's, uh, there's the, uh, the scandal that each of us are, have to deal with uh, in our own diocese, sometimes in our own parish, depending on the work that we're doing, and certainly depending on who's listening to this podcast, you know, it may be happening in your own school if, you, if you're a development director there. Um, how should a case for support reflect that, or should it, or should there be some element there that deals with what somebody might be thinking is the elephant in the room. True, true. One of the things we're doing um, with some of the clients I'm working with is mm, it's not always technically in the case for support up front, um, but we will have supporting documents like the frequently asked questions uh, is where we'll sometimes put things, you know, will any of this money be used for lawsuits? Will, uh, you know, how do I know that the funds that I give to my parish are actually going to come back to my parish and that they're going to be used accordingly. What processes have been put in place? So I think some of it is making sure that those processes beyond, you know, or supporting documents, whatever it may be, um, are, are available beyond the case for support, but also, um, you know, not just available. We have a, a hard copy we can hand out, but has it been put on the website? How has it been addressed? You know, and what is a consistent, What's the consistent messaging that we're using to address it? You know, when we have a team out there, I want to make sure that my team is saying the same thing across the board, that we're all informed and, and communicating it consistently. Um, within the case itself, I just think the more that we can say specifically, 
how much of the dollars are going, you know, how much are going back to the parishes, and then how much are there larger diocesan needs? Um, so say, you know, some some campaigns do a 50-50 split between the parish and the diocese. Um, some do a 70-30 or, or any of those in between. You know, for the funds that are going back to those diocesan needs, um, how do those how do those flesh out? You know, how do those support the parishes and how much, you know, how much money is going to be designated to them? When are they going to see that impact? Um, you know, what does that really mean if we say some of the funds are going towards, you know, Catholic schooling or evangelization? Well, what does that mean? So really um, asking the client, the whether it be the diocese or the parish um, or a school, whatever, whatever the organization asking them to really dig deep and, and to say we need more details um, on some of these needs because the more details, the more knowledge and information we can share. Um, and the more knowledge and information you share with folks, then they, they become more comfortable with it. Um, again, I mean, that's just another kind of living, breathing document I feel like we always have that accompanies our cases. Here's frequently asked questions. That's something that's always changing. And, and as these things come up in questions like this, uh, being prepared to answer them, um, not just by what, not just call so-and-so, but no, here is the consistent answer that we are all sharing. This is what we are doing. These are the actions that we have taken. Um, in one of our clients, uh, you know, we have steps put in for the foundation to oversee the funds that are going back to parishes to make sure, you know, there is a process. There is a little bit of paperwork just, and it's not to hold off on giving anyone back the money, but it's just to make sure that the donor's intention is being fulfilled and that they are giving that back. So I would say in terms of the case, just the more detailed you're able to be while still being flexible, <laughs> um, it, the better that, that you can share, you know, really what is the intention of these funds, um, but being ready to have supporting documents on hand to help answer and address um, questions that you may not want to include up front right within the case, but you do want to make sure that you are addressing. And Colleen's point about the, you know, the scandal um, and, you know, how the camp, whether or not the campaign funds would support, um, you know, legal fees and so on and so forth. And we, we, it's a sensitive matter and we, you know, that's part of our relationship with our uh, diocesan based um, clients and to help the pastors to provide, the appropriate talking points uh, to his, uh, his parishioners, and what I found personally is is an it's an opportunity uh, to look beyond while the church is addressing um, the, the, you know the situation. Um, it also gives the the church the opportunity of uh, almost reinvigorating itself to remind parishioners of of why the church has been important for him or her in their lifetime. We've all had moments um, where the church was there for us. So, you know, try to, to look beyond these individuals that unfortunately have scarred the church. Um, and there, there are wounds, of course, and parishioners are still grappling with that and, and how they're going to support, uh, you know, their, their parish. Maybe not now, but, you know, it might take some time. But either way, it's an, you know, that case development process is beginning. You know, it's a it's a, a healing process uh, to remind uh, to remind parishioners of how important his or her church is, um, and and so that that that's because that becomes the inspiring aspect of it. That we're not just you know not going to look simply at the how the how the scandal is impacting. We will deal with it. But at the same time, this is an opportunity to look beyond, you know, the individuals that you know, scarred us. You know, that's a it's a good point. One of the um, one of the circumstances we were dealing with is um, a parish that you know knew some names of a report, and, and you know, and it, it impacted them personally. Um, and what we went out and we talked to them about, and did it slow things down a little bit? It did, yes, but it didn't, not in a bad way. It was just more about some healing time and some some communicating, um, uh, and really understanding. You know, yes, this may have happened on the on a, on, a, on some level over here, but really kind of getting them to look at their own parish and say. But that, just because this is going on over here, doesn't mean that we don't still have needs. 
it doesn't mean that our pews are necessarily full. Like we have great things going on here and we still do not ha- do have needs. Why do we have to wait? Why should we wait to address those needs? It just because this is happening doesn't make the needs of our parish any less important. It doesn't make them any less relevant, you know? Um, And some of them really are time sensitive, you know, especially when you're talking about a capital project or trying to implement a program. Um, So really getting them to say, we understand on a larger level, on a larger scale, this is this is the environment that we're in. But as much as you can, let's look at the, the funds that are coming back to your parish and how can we focus on still continuing to have a positive, uh, growing, vibrant parish community, even despite these times, because... Because we are still here and we are still important. And why why does that parish have to be put on hold? You know, so really getting them to look and think about um, internally and, and really locally, you know, their community. Um, why should they have to wait to address these things? Um, you know, it's, I, I, it's easier said than done, I recognize. <laughs> but, you know, but just having them think about that, you know, like, well, what's next for your parish and, and why... Why should you have to be delayed? You know, the needs are real and they're here. So if we can keep moving and pressing forward, um, there's no reason that we shouldn't. And that's part of that uh, point that I made earlier is what would happen if we don't do this? What would you do if your parish did not exist? Mm -hmm. And I think donors may have a a, you know hard time answering that question, but it's a reality. You know, it kind of puts a reality of you know this. We need to be able to sustain. This community, this Catholic community of which uh, has been the lifeblood of your family and other, you know, families uh, within within the parish, and as I said, it just becomes a way of bringing the community together. Well, and it goes back to Caitlin's point about, you know, it's something that maybe our, you know, in in the faith based world, we're not always great about doing about saying, you know, why is the parish important to me? Why is my, my Catholic community important to me here? What are all the good things, um, that we've done that, that we've done together or that the parish has done for me or, uh, you know, or my Catholic school, whatever it may be, it, what are those good things? And so it is kind of taking that internal deeper look at, you know, okay, I, I recognize external, there's a lot of things, but internally, what has it been done what has it done over the years? What has it meant to me? Why is it important? Um, so why do I feel the need to support it now for, for these initiatives? I think what you're really describing is uh, reminding people to take ownership of their parish. That this, mm-hmm. that although this, um, this terrible thing has happened, and, uh, and we all acknowledge it, that, um, that the church belongs to all of us. Right. You know? And when you can get a donor to, uh, to take ownership of that and to embrace that, then, then you've got something special. Right. Yeah. It's a reflection of the community and not necessarily that, as I said earlier, that yeah. one individual who, mm-hmm. you know, is scarred the church for, you know, for unfortunately. So last, uh, last comment, uh, question rather, I should say, and we'll go around the table here. Um, giving USA came out recently, uh, individual giving is down. And uh, for the first time, giving to religion is below 30%. So really a uh, significant hit. F- uh, some of that may have tax implications for the new, new giving laws. Uh, but certainly there are folks listening to the podcast who are thinking, okay, yeah, my giving falls into that category. My giving's down. So uh, there may be a development director or a pastor or a bishop uh, who's listening to this. And, uh, you know, they're wondering, you know, what's next. So, uh, you know, what's your advice? First and foremost for me is just to remain true to your to your church, to your organization, uh, nonprofit. Don't lose sight of um, why your organization exists. You have a purpose, and while giving may be down, you know, nationally, um, I, I think uh, those ebb and flows will always happen. But at the same time, you know, over in overtime, the organization has sustained itself. And why is that? Is that because we've been true to our mission? We've been true to why we're why we exist and what we do. And to Colleen's point, the impact that we've had, don't lose sight of that. I think that's very key. Um, and because donors, you know, they may sway, but they may come. They'll come back. 
Um, not sure when, but that's part of that process. Um, and it's just the, it's an evolving process. Um, so, you know, my advice is don't, you know, there may be course corrections as we talked about earlier, but at the same time, you know, organizations that continue to stay true to, uh, their organizational mission and, and, and purpose will continue to, uh, to, to continue to sustain themselves and exist well over time. I would say educate and communicate you know there's you know giving is down and 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 there's more choices in, in terms of who are you giving to where are you giving make sure that your parishioners or or your school community that they understand what you're doing your vision for the future um where their dollars are going in terms of an annual appeal or an annual fund you know keep communicating that don't um don't let up because they need to be reminded and, and, and maybe there's, there's ways that you can either even further step, you know, take it another level and say, here's, here's what we've done over the past three years, five years, you know, here is how you, your support has moved us forward. And here's where we want to go next. You know, this is, we still like the times we we're ready to change as needed to and and this is you know our community is growing or it's diversifying or you know and here's how we want to keep growing and and we want to keep communicating with you and and you know just really kind of making sure that that um that communication and that community feeling is there and and you're not afraid to share it because there's a bunch of organizations out there who are going to be sharing you know why why they're the right choice so don't forget like you should not put your hand on you you still are important and you are you you are the right choice for many to be a top priority phil philanthropically um but remember to stay present and and know that donors need to be reminded of that often right. and then also i would say look internally and think don't be afraid to make tweaks and changes, you know, with, with social media, there, there's certain parishes, not every parish, but some that we are working with that, you know, they have someone, they have a Facebook page and they have an ambassador who, who is helping and volunteering in, in support of the campaign to get that message out there within the parish, you know, so that may be new. It may feel a little funny. It doesn't mean you should leave everything else, you know, to throw everything else out, but think about how to change you know what does your parish family look like now what are what's the the median age you know wh where how are things changing you know are there a lot more you know young adults are are there less if there's less what can we do to maybe bring some more in or maybe we can talk to those that are in the pews now and say hey Where's your friends that you went to high school with? Let's get them back here. You know, <laughs> right, so sure. so just being open, yeah, just engaged. you know, yeah. engaged and communicating. Um, the more people feel part of that community of faith in in whatever way it may be, the more they're going to be excited and willing um, to get involved and be engaged. Um, so keep pressing on. <laughs> yeah. and, and finding out those ways that we can, you know, help a client to determine why giving may be down for their particular, you know, um, you know, church or um, organization. Um, so you look at, yes, the national data says giving is down. Okay. So let's, let's look at it from a, a micro level in terms of, you know, asking our donors, you know, we, we're trying to provide a, a compelling reason, reason for them to give and, and donate. Uh, reverse the question and ask, why are you not giving? And, and, and understanding their reasons. And, and, and as to Colleen's point, that's part of the communication process. That's part of the engagement process. And um, I think donors would appreciate that just, you know, to understand, um, yeah, I, yeah I'm, my philanthropic support, I have to, you know, take a step back or what have you. Uh, but understanding and appreciating uh, ways to re-engage them so that giving and, you know, percentages will, will, you know, incrementally increase over time. My advice would be to keep innovating and to keep the faith. Um, you know, certainly during times of challenge, really the only way to get through is to keep an open mind, be creative and to pray. I mean, that's really all you need to do. Um, and, you know, 
you will get through it. And I think just grounding yourselves in transparency and strong leadership, accountable leadership, leading by example during these times is also something that's critically important for every Catholic organization right now. Well, Caitlin, Colleen, Ray, this was a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate your expertise and your passion for the work that we do and being a part of this conversation today. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Great pleasure. I want to thank Colleen Burdick, Ray Witzkowski, and Caitlin McTighe for the excellent conversation today. If you want to reach out to one of them, I've included links to their bios and contact information in the show notes on our website. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to them. They'd be happy to hear from you. Well, that's our show this week. Special thanks to the Changing Our World podcast team and to Pottery Studios for helping to produce our show. If you'd like more information about our podcast, please visit us at advancingourchurch.com. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Advancing Our Church is a production of Changing Our World, a fundraising and social impact consulting firm that has been advising both nonprofits and corporations for the past 20 years. For more information, please visit us at changingourworld.com. Well, that's all for today, everybody. I hope you're having a fantastic summer. Have a great week. Take care. and God bless.